just right before I introduce Naomi, I'm going to introduce another Naomi who's sitting in the corner over there, and uh, Jackie who's sitting, who's um, Jenny who's <laughs> signing there, just to say that we have two of our great signers, and all day they've been signing, and uh, we just outside, uh, Naomi just said, what's the sign for vagina? And they said, <laughs> it's that. Um, so we obviously all speak the same language uh, somewhere along the line. <laughs> all practice that, please. All right. Marvellous, marvellous, marvellous darlings. Um, Eve Ensler would be proud of us. Uh, I just also wanted to say that in this very hall, Maria Callas, Jimi Hendrix, hmm. Frank Sinatra, Liza Minnelli, Naomi Wolf. Oh. <laughs> and Jude Kelly and our signers. And actually, I think that is very significant because um, the, the, when people look back in history, and they will, you know, the, obviously what happens in all these halls get archived just out of interest. The second concert that was ever performed here in 1951 was an entire program of world music, just in case we think we invented it with the record labels in 1980. That's, you know, the, the, the idea that this hall is about a great safe space for, to debate difficult subjects. It's entirely appropriate. Uh, but let me just say how excited I was that Naomi, um, despite jet lag, decided that she could make this program tonight. Obviously, um, she is you know, one of the most sought after speakers in the world. And uh, she's really picked up the mantle of other uh, philosophers who are popular philosophers. I don't know whether that's a, a phrase you'd be happy I'm with. I'm okay with that. Okay, good. <laughs> um, uh, but um, the, the idea of taking you know, difficult subjects, taboo subjects, and really uh, l understanding them and leafing through them and bringing proper historical perspective onto them and also, of course, a personal perspective. So it is both academically rigorous, but it's also highly open and, and, and personal. And I think that combination makes, makes her a unique and beautiful writer. Um, she's a, a great public figure, and she's been so since she published the Beauty Myths in the Beauty Myth in 1991. Um, just her biography, for those of you who don't know, or, 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 she's an author and campaigner. She's written seven books, and um, she's a, a co-founder of the Wood Hall Institute for Ethical Leadership, which we might talk about shortly. An organisation founded to train young women leaders, and she's a co-founder of the American Freedom Campaign. She's a graduate of Yale University, she was a Rhodes Scholar, and she's now working towards a doctorate in Victorian literature at New College, Oxford University. She lives in New York City with her family. So, um, one of the things I wanted to say was that I gave my son a copy of Vagina um, <laughs> a, 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 a while ago. He's 22, uh -huh. and um, he took it away. I gave it to him for his birthday. He looked a bit surprised, but anyway... <laughs> It's just a true story, and um, my daughter reminded me of this earlier, and he came back to me about two weeks later, and he said, Mummy, I've read 50 pages. Is that enough about rape now? <laughs> he said, do I have to keep reading it? And I said, well, you can come back to it any time throughout your entire life. Um, but the, 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 the thing that I thought was so fascinating about that book, and it's not the first thing I want to talk about, really, is the... Um, is the amount that it was almost like a completely new starting point for you, thinking about something which you discovered in yourself physically and personally, and then asking lots of questions about maybe the way you'd previously thought or what you hadn't known was the, 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 um, the case. Um, and, and for that reason, I think there was a lot of controversy around the book. There was a lot of controversy around the book because you speak as you find and you speak as you've researched, but it's all of it's quite new information for some people. Yeah, I mean, shall I respond to respond that to that? Last? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, is it okay if I sort of sit like this? It's okay if you do anything you like. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I, I will plunge in and respond, but I just want to take thirty seconds to say how grateful I am and honored I am to be here at this festival which I was actually saying to anyone who would listen is really my idea of, of the ideal of how feminism should be and move forward right now. It's global, it's inspiring, it's about all the things that women are doing all over the world and together. Um, it's, it, you know, doesn't shy away from 
uh, controversy and engagement, discussion, debate, civil discourse, and uh, it's vibrant, and it's, it's a whole breath of fresh air, a manifestation of um, the best things about our moment in feminism. So thank you to you who has <laughs> made you. this happen from infancy man it to a huge huge success thank you thank you thank you thank you and you know it's just so amazing for me to be here with my own idols and icons i mean one after the other i keep meeting them and i'm sort of starstruck and astonished and you know you're alice walker you're on and on so um so now to speak about your point i think that what you were saying is that the book begins with my own experience mm. that led me on this journey of research and so the, that's correct, and, and that that was one reason it was so controversial, and I think that's also correct. So very briefly, for those of you, uh, you know, who may not be familiar with, with the book or the controversy, um, I always knew I wanted to write a book called Vagina um, for a lot of reasons, uh, mostly that ever since I've been writing about women's issues, and I'm very interested, as you notice so beautifully, uh, in the history of ideas that affect women because so many of the things that oppress us, someone invented and then tried to persuade us to believe their ideologies. So it's incredibly liberating to find out where they began, like with the beauty myth. Someone made that shit up, you know, and we found out who and why. Um, but uh, with vagina, I always knew that there was something I had to report on about the vagina and the discourses and taboos and shamings around the vagina throughout history and throughout cultures, because I knew that this held the answer um, to so many ways that women are oppressed. It was like at the core of the effort to subjugate and control women, starting with making us feel bad about ourselves, which has always been a, a, a source of tremendous, uh, tremendously compelling to me ever since even before the beauty myth. Mm -hmm. um, but I never thought it would be this personal book at the very beginning. There are six personal pages that made everyone very, very uh, shocked and astonished. Um, and I'll tell you what they are. The first several drafts of the book um, were not in the first person, had no personal information at all. And uh, I really would have preferred that because I knew that if I told the truth about my own experience, um, it is uh, breaking a taboo. Women are not supposed to talk about their sexual experiences. They're certainly not supposed to talk about pleasure um, or desire in the first person. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I, I just knew because of my chapter on language that the minute you go there, you know, you become sort of fair game for all kinds of abuse. But, so what happened to me was, and, and I really kind of wrestled, I didn't want to write about my own experience, but I finally realized after a long uh, dark night of the soul that I really had no choice mm -hmm. because if I didn't put my own experience in, in those six pages, I thought in a very neutral way, you all, those of you who've read the book, would ask me at some point what led you to this research. And I'd have to at that point either lie or tell the truth. And I never lie to my readers. So also as a journalist, I know that I experienced a first-hand uh, eyewitness ex testimony of a very important um, fact that I then researched in many, many other people, many, many other situations. And I know the power and the relevance as a journalist of eyewitness testimony. Um, so b for both of those reasons, I felt like there was no choice but to put those six pages in. Now, what happened? Well, you might ask. Um, I started to develop a, a, a physical sensations, uh, symptoms, and I'm saying this to 700 strangers in the darkness, you know, but I'll just plunge Speak ahead. Speak the truth. Right, right, because um, you've created this safe space, and also because it's already in print, so. Um, um, but I developed, uh, I started to develop physical uh, symptoms of a loss of sexual sensation, which was disturbing enough, but I also was noticing that along with these physical symptoms, I was experiencing a loss of states of mind, states of consciousness, positive states of consciousness that I had always associated with how I felt um, after making love. And, it, and I was starting to experience what neuroscientists call anhedonia, which is a state of kind of depression. Uh, the world is 
bleak and sort of meaningless and things don't seem to connect and everything is kind of um, drab. Uh, and I was very obviously disturbed. I, to fast forward, I, I got diagnosed quickly, thank God, with a very good medical team. I had a serious spinal injury that resulted from having been born with a variant of spina bifida that I'd never known about. And the spinal injury was compressing a nerve that was a pelvic nerve. And who knew about that? It's in the book. But this explained my sexual uh, symptoms. It also explained my, my states of mind. Because what happened, amazingly, was that when I had surgery and that issue was corrected, I recovered sexual sensation fully. Thank you. <laughs> but I also recovered, to, again, to my astonishment, these layers and layers and layers of consciousness that I thought I would never have again and that life really didn't seem worth living that much without them. Um, so, you know, things seemed meaningful. I felt energized. I saw joy in the world. You know, uh, I was curious again. I, mm -hmm. All of these states of mind returned to me. So that made, I, I thought, what happened? Something happened here. There's something important here. And that led me to the research and also to the scientists and uh, medical practitioners at the cutting edge of this field of research, what, what it led me to find was what I, I didn't expect to put in the book, but I think it's the most exciting thing about the book, 15 years of absolutely cutting edge neuroscientific discoveries about a brain-vagina connection, which has not been reported on outside of medical journals, scientific journals, which um, to me explained, and I can get into this in a follow-up question if you like, so many mysteries about the female condition, including one reason, one major reason that female sexuality, female desire has been mocked, degraded, debased, made fun of, controlled, and sometimes mutilated for 5,000 years. Mm -hmm. the, 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 this, I, because uh, when I read the book and started making the connection myself about something which I also have experienced, which is um, that the euphoria of orgasm, the, uh, the, uh, and then all these sort of cascades of feelings as a result of orgasm. She's saying it too. No, well, I mean, <laughs> no, go ahead, what go is ahead. the point of, you know, being shy? Right, absolutely. Um, it's, it's 700 of our best friends. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, I do think this is really important, you know, that it is very interesting how people can come and quite rightly disclose tragedy. One has to. But we've got to be happier about disclosing pleasure too. Um, yeah. But the, the, but the, um, the idea of this sort of incredible r range of feelings and emotions and euphoria and, and energy that is released, um, it's something which both men and women seem to be cross about the possibility that, that might be the case, i.e. the, oh, the, the brain-vagina relationship. Right. Right. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, why you felt there was this sort of reaction mm -hmm. to the idea of this brain-vagina relationship, as sure. if you were sort of saying something that was going to harm the idea of women's liberation in some way. I understand your question. Yeah, that's a great question. So can I... Could I trouble someone backstage actually for a but pillow? More cushions? Yes. Uh, but it's, I mean, it's okay if it doesn't. So somebody you know, will do that. Out of thin well, air. They don't look sure. like they're there, they are. Um, there'll be a message going down from the brain to the vagina. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and a cushion will appear. <laughs> um, so I, I get Something what you're soft. saying. So w I think what, what Jude is very politely referring to is that a lot of um, initial critical responses were very angry and they seem to be saying, uh, and this is so revealing, that if I call attention to this science about the brain-vagina connection, I'm somehow abandoning feminism or reducing women to vaginas or pushing women backwards. So this was so interesting to me because um, it, it revealed to me that, I mean, first let me say why I rebut that position. I, I think it's preposterous. If you respect women's vaginas and you respect their brains, there should be nothing degrading about addressing the science about how they relate. The other thing I want to say about men and, and the mind-body connection with male sexuality is that 
it is absolutely taken for granted, and study after study confirms, that when men experience erectile dysfunction, other aspects of their well-being suffer. They don't feel good about themselves, they don't feel happy about work, they don't feel energized about the future, and that when you treat erectile dysfunction in men, all kinds of other measures of their well-being in other areas, you know, uh, <laughs> rise, <laughs> you know. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the other thing I want to say about how preposterous this position is, is that it's science. You know, I'm not making it up. There are hundreds of footnotes at the back of the book. You can argue with the lab rats in Jim Faust's lab, if you like, but what kind of feminism is afraid to look at data, right? I mean, this mm -hmm. is what I love mm -hmm. about the, this festival. You're not afraid to engage with something that might make you challenge, make all of us challenge our assumptions. But now, what it, that criticism did make me think is that we don't respect women's vaginas enough. And when I say vagina, I use it medically inaccurately. I'm actually referring to the whole uh, plexus of sexual and other kinds of pleasure that I identify that actually our understanding of, the, of female sexual response doesn't even incorporate adequately, um, meaning the clitoris, the inner labia, the outer labia, the perineum, uh, the, you know, introitis, which is what doctors call the vagina itself, the mouth of the cervix, Barry Commissaric at Rutgers has found a new sexual center at the mouth of the cervix, the G-spot, um, the sexual response of that has been well documented. It turns out there are things about our actual anatomy that are revolutionary that haven't been widely reported, like the G-spot and the clitoris are not separate places. They're in fact the north and the south of one single neural structure that they've recently identified such that 90% of women reach orgasm in lab conditions with strangers when both of these are stimulated at the same time. So that, this alone is worth the price of admission, I would say. You, know, you want to take notes. <laughs> and we have um, a lab for Mark. No, we don't. But, <laughs> but just, just quickly, what it, what it made me see is that there has been a detour in feminism. If you go back 200 years, in the 1870s, in the 19-teens and 20s, again in the 70s with uh, the women's, I'm sorry, the Judy Chicago, mm -hmm. the, the vaginas, dinner table, yeah. the dinner table, dinner party, dinner party yeah. and um, Betty Dodson, who was teaching women to masturbate, and Sheer Height, who published the Height Report in 1976, Erica Jong, the Zipless Fuck. Um, but for... for 200 years, feminists have been seeing the empowerment of women around knowing about what gives them pleasure, knowing about their anatomy and sexuality as being right at the center of the feminist project. And we've, we're in a weird detour. I think it dates from the 80s, and I'd have to say maybe from Catherine McKinnon and Andrea Dworkin, uh, and critiques of pornography, understandably, because porn was such a huge, scary thing mm -hmm. in is, some yeah. ways that... Feminism could only kind of go, ah, you know, it, in many ways. We're in a weirdly, um, how can I put it, ob oblivion-saturated time with this kind of criticism that anyone would argue from a feminist perspective that is anti-feminist to care about women's sexuality and pleasure. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think that the, the um, whole idea of the anxiety that if you come up with certain facts that don't suit the story, this will take back the notion that women's equality is a given. Right. You know, this is, this is the dilemma, isn't it? That, that I mean, my, my guess is that we're all sitting here because we absolutely believe that equality for women is an inevitable and important right that we'll, we will arrive at eventually somehow. Right. Um, and so, obviously, we've spent years putting together the mosaic of all the arguments. Mm. And sometimes you end up putting them together in a way that may not entirely be correct, but it seems the best way of winning the, the argument at the time. Right. I mean, so I think that your book, Fire with Fire, which you wrote in 2003, I think it was. A long it? time ago, yeah. Um, I mean, for me, that uh -huh. was a fantastically liberating book. Thank you. For those of you who don't know it, I mean, that was a book that basically said, do you know what? We are going to be equal. We're sort of en route now to be equal. There's so many things that have been achieved, amazing things that have been achieved. Women now need to recognize that 
dump the idea of being a victim, if they can, and start taking full responsibility for moving forward. Just to jump in a little bit, not dump it because women are horribly victimized, no, but, I don't not, mean, but uh, try not to identify with it yeah. at the expense of their strength. Sorry, you're quite right to pull me up on that. But, but basically to find the courage, I suppose, when appropriate, to feel that they could go forward with, with and take responsibility for things which people have told them they can't do, like technology and the use of power in certain kinds of ways. And the, the, um, the, the discovery of new pieces of fact that might be different from the ones we've been taught before in the feminist movement doesn't make that an impossible thing to achieve. The discovery of... Well, I, I certainly understand what you're saying, that some of the science that That's I reported I mean. on is, dis, is uh, challenging to a lot of our comfortable truisms as feminists. Is mm -hmm. that what you mean? Yeah. Let me. She's totally right. And let me stress also that when I did this research, my jaw was dropping. I, you know, I thought I was sophisticated to some extent, and I was always interested in sex and read about it and knew about it. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is heaven. This is the man brings the pillow, you know. It's heaven. Um, but uh, even though I followed discussion about sexuality pretty carefully, a lot of the science I was reading about just kept astonishing me. And some of it, you know, definitely complicates some feminist dogma. But that's not my problem, in a way, because I respect women, and I respect men who care about women, and I trust people to be able to engage with the science and wrestle with it and check it out against their own lives. Let me give you some examples of what Jude might be referring to. Um, Okay, we're in a sexual revolution. Woohoo! Everything's been taken care of. That's a truism. It's from the culture, not so much from feminism, but it's like the mm -hmm. dominant culture says this. And we know all about female sexuality. Well, it turns out that the sexual revolution isn't working well for women as female sexuality is defined right now. 30% um, of women today in this society, in my society in North America as well, self-report that they don't reach orgasm regularly when they want to. And that's a problem for them as they define it, not someone else. And another 30%, some of the same women and some different women, self-report as a problem for them as they define it. Low libido. They're not into it. It's not working for them. Um, and these numbers haven't budged and in some, days have got, in some ways have gotten worse than the numbers that Sheer Height reported for female sexual frustration in 1976. Um, but there are other things that are really kind of shocking to our feminist truisms, or at least make us wrestle. So one of them has to do with, um, all right, I'll just describe it. When there's this amazing potent cocktail that happens in the female brain when women when a woman allows herself and is supported by her culture in anticipating and seeking out pleasure, sexual pleasure, and especially in knowing how to make it happen for herself, because being in control of what gives you pleasure is, is the number one dopey, uh, dopamine enhancer. But basically, when, when a woman feels supported, whatever her background, whatever her sexuality, whether she's in a relationship or, or, or uh, she's on her own, when, when she's anticipating sexual pleasure, dopamine is boosted in her brain. Now, dopamine, I jokingly call it the ultimate feminist neurotransmitter because it goes to, sorry? I'm so sorry. <clears throat> dopamine, how's that? I, I call it the ultimate feminist neurotransmitter. Does that mean you all haven't heard what I've been saying or what Jude has been saying until now? Wow, we should speak no. up maybe. All right. Um, it, it makes you, it goes to focus and drive and motivation, assertiveness, trust in your own judgment, confidence, right? Um, cocaine is acting on dopamine, um, the dopamine system. And you know how cocaine makes shy people assertive and gregarious and talkative, right? When a woman reaches orgasm, this is what you were talking about, it boosts it boosts opioids, which are about bliss and ecstasy and transcendence. These are not my hippie words. These, this is the language of the, the scientific journals because it is an opioid. It produces ecstasy. 
And then after orgasm, or when someone nice that you like has done a lot of other things to you like, suck your nipples, um, caress your nipples, caress your body. Women's bodies respond differently than men's do to being stroked. Um, after 10 minutes of stroking, it raises oxytocin levels by 10% in women, not in men. Um, so this will boost oxytocin. While there's some discussion about exactly what oxytocin does, it is for sure related to trust and feelings of intimacy and closeness. So to me as a writer, and I imagine to you as a creative person, which is why so many cr women involved in creative work have been responding to this idea, um, this is a powerful set of hormones and neurotransmitters to use for writing a better novel, being a better leader, being a better mom, you know, energy to, you know, figure things out in the lab, like insight. And wherever you are in your life, it's, it's not surprising that there's this whole male tradition of the muse, right, and the relationship between male eroticism and creativity, because these are some very creative hormones and neurotransmitters. But as a feminist, I also had to notice that dopamine especially makes you less easy to push around, right? More sure of yourself, more confident, more ready to stand your ground. Those are feminist qualities, right? And so to me, this was the aha moment. Female sexual pleasure makes you less easy to subordinate and subdue. In a, in a heartbeat, it explained to me why clitoridectomy, why so much traumatic rape in conflict areas and in war zones, um, why a constant barrage of sexualized insults at the vagina in workplaces where men don't want women to participate, um, and why for 5,000 years women have been encouraged not to know about what gives them pleasure, not to feel good about their vaginas, their clitorises, their labia, not to explore them, not to discuss in a straightforward way their interest in pleasure, because your pleasure empowers you in other ways that make you stroppier, right? And more challenging. And, and I say, round of applause to that, mm -hmm. you know? Okay. Thank you. Oh, but to transition, I'm sorry. I keep kind of, she's asking such good questions, I keep sort of going, and this. Um, why would that freak some people out? Yeah. It freaks people out because I think we've internalized the idea that female sexuality is ridiculous. And so how can I possibly, I mean, I respect Zoe Heller a lot. She's a very smart woman. She wrote something not very thoughtful, I think, about this issue in her review of my book. Um, and when she was asked about it later by a commentator, and I was present, she said something like, well, Naomi is saying we need to get fucked well if we're gonna write good books. And I said nothing of the kind, um, but it, it does, and so I could see people saying, well, you're, you're saying we can't get there without Eros. And I'm not saying that. There was a lot of reductive um, overreading of what the book actually says. But the science says that the energy that one can get from pleasure, not just the science, the women I interviewed, dozens, scores of women wrote to me saying, I had this am amazing sexual experience, and often it's by themselves, a, a sexual awakening by themselves, which is very important. I mean, one thing doctors don't say to you, which they should regularly, is, are you masturbating? Be sure to masturbate, you know, because, because of the health and psychological benefits that we can get into in a follow-up question. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they... But in a sense, yeah, it, I mean... It, it's internalizing the reduction of, yeah. of it as silly. I mean, yeah. really, self-realization of the body, mind, and spirit in everything a human is capable of feeling and doing is, is where you'd want feminism to go. I mean, I want feminism to go wherever it wants to go and, and to go as many places as there are people who call themselves feminists, because I believe, which is why I respect you so much, in this multiplicity of voices. But it does seem absurd to me to so devalue women's pleasure, so internalize the idea that there's something icky and gross about the vagina and something ridiculous about women's pleasure. Another analogy, okay, I came, or shall I stop with the analogizing? No, no I think there. we're all enjoying discussing this, are we, for a minute? <laughs>
Yeah, all we'll right, move on in a minute. You. We won't discuss the vagina all night, but I think just to finish this. All right. I'm just thinking about when we asked our signers what clitoris was. It was a little more complicated. It was something like this. They had to draw it. Yes. They said, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> is she showing it? But it? Oh, nice. She's asking it's where beautiful. it is. <laughs> I want that T-shirt. I want a T-shirt with this symbol. And I want people to ask me, what does that mean? You know? It's beautiful. Um, so I grew up in San Francisco in the 70s at sort of the, the center of the gay and lesbian liberation movement. And my mom uh, wrote a book when I was growing up called The Lesbian Community. And I'm so proud of her, even though at the time um, it was difficult to explain to my friends why my mom was out every night at lesbian bars. Um, but um, I, I grew up surrounded by the deep imprinting with visibly seeing how a group of people whose sexuality just a few years before had been shamed and mocked and derided, gay men and lesbians, right? And you know, laws had been in place and still were in the early 60s, you know, into the mid 60s to criminalize their love. How simply all at once when this whole group of people stopped and said, we're not going to be ashamed anymore. We're gonna own this debasing language. We're gonna call ourselves queer. You know, we're going to say what it means. We're going to write and paint and celebrate our sexuality and our love. Um, it didn't just transform laws about men sleeping with men and women sleeping with women. It did that. But that wasn't the bigger thing. I saw how it transformed these people in ways far beyond who they were sleeping with and, you know, what kind of pleasure and orgasms they had. I saw, I saw people becoming integrated and shining and radiant who had not had a place for that to happen in the culture, mm -hmm. you know, mere years before. And I saw it transforming society, too. So how can we recognize that gay and lesbian respect for their sexuality and sexual practices and love is a human rights issue and an issue involving profound issues of dignity, and we don't, like, make fun of gay male sexuality in public in the same way that people used to routinely in the early 60s and 50s. And yet the way that the, the names and epithets and mockery that arose, you know, that is regularly directed at women's vaginas and women's sexualities, you know, of all, of all sexualities, it is routine. Um, that just is astonishing to me. Mm -hmm. uh, along with rape jokes, for example. Oh, rape jokes. I mean, but, but, but the, the, this um, idea that, you know, women's fulfillment is an entitlement. Can, wh where does, I was thinking I didn't about... didn't exactly say that. Women's I, mean, I like the idea of it being an entitlement. I, I think Government it's... funded entitlement? <laughs> <laughs> if necessary. <laughs> <laughs> I think these labs need to be underwritten by the government. Um, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, tomorrow we've got a debate about misogyny and misandry. Mm. Um, and th th this is sort of a slight aside thing, but what I was thinking the other day about, about um, dictators and how psychopaths, if they're very clever and very organized and very particular, they end up being dictators. Oh, yeah. And that most people don't recognize it happening because they can't really believe that somebody really is that ruthless mm. and really is that uh, uh, lacking in empathy mm. until it's too late to right. realize it. Right. And I was, you know, and there's lots and lots of, sort of cultural issues around what boys and men have come to believe mm. and then enact. Mm. But that's not the same as misogyny. Mm -hmm. However, there is misogyny. And I, it made me wonder whether misogynists also move their way into, a, into strong power bases because the drive of anger or the drive of hatred or the, mm -hmm. the drive of, of, of wanting something right. to, be, uh, to be shut away, right. if you feel that drive, then you try to presumably enact it in some way. Right. And I'm just wondering whether the, the, the misogyny that still exists in society, which can be really incredible and, 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 mm. and difficult, whether you see that in places of power um, and you think it belongs to particular individuals or whether you, you think it's just a general cultural issue because, you know, we've got into a situation where the language can be men this, men that, and, and the, it, it implies all men yeah. have this misogynist dream. I, I try never to use that language, by the way. Um, I think it's sexist. It is sexist, yeah. yes. Now, having said that, misogyny is very real 
And I guess what I would say is rather than have misogynists sort of made headway in the culture, it's more that um, misogyny in the culture makes headway into individuals, mm -hmm. is, is more how I see it. Let me give you an example. Um, but be, while I answer this, I really want to stress how, how hopeful I feel about individual men, especially in the wake of interviewing them about this book and in the wake of getting beautiful emails. I get these emails from men saying, you know, I'm 90 years old and my beloved wife died five years ago and, you know, in 1916 I first learned how to whatever and I've cherished her ever since. And, you know, deep, heartfelt love, I mean, it, and, un, and wishing that what they were learning about women was not so pornographized, you know, that what their sons would learn about women was not so reductive, that it, wanting a cherishing of female mm -hmm. eros and the feminine principle to be part of the culture of men. Um, but I think what happens often goes like this. I think that it's very revolutionary. And Whitman said this, and you know, many people have said this, but if, if men and women, and I don't just mean men and women, men and men, women and women, and so on, if we all actually reverenced each other, um, all kinds of power interests would lose their hold um, because sexuality is a very potentially subversive and radical alternative to, to other forms of control, to forms of control. It's potentially very liberating, as we talked about, this, these crazy chemicals, right? Love, mm -hmm. crazy liberating thing. So love is, what I would say rather than genderizing it, is love is scary to power structures. Um, and that's why the great lovers like Jesus and Gandhi are always kind of given a very hard time. Um, so I went to Sierra Leone uh, in the wake of um, the civil war there. And in rebel-held territory, I met little boys, like 12 and 13 and 14-year-old boys who'd been kidnapped and trained as child soldiers and taught to be rapists. And they were used to traumatically rape women and girls as part of this subjugating of these territories. Now, these were little kids, you know, and they were playing soccer, and it was obvious to me, I'm the mother of a son, that these were children, and that they had been taken over by this misogynistic entity that was using them and embedding their masculinity in this awful structure and traumatizing them in the process as well. Now I know why, it was t because traumatizing women vaginally, traumatizing them with rape, we haven't talked about rape, but I have amazing new data in a section on rape that shows that rape changes the female body, rape changes the female mind, even years after the assault, even if it's a quote unquote nonviolent assault, there is no such thing as a nonviolent rape, the new science confirms that. Um, but so misogyny was using these boys, I don't think the they would, they would not have done this no. had they not been forced to. Um, so that scares me more in a way. Individual sociopaths don't scare me. The, the great big colonization. I mean, we haven't talked about porn, but I'm meeting across Western Europe, across North America, young men and, and young women who can no longer have, can no longer get aroused and make love with someone they're attracted to without porn being part of the mm -hmm. picture. They can't do it. I now know why. There's a science that I report on in Vagina of desensitization. Um, pornography very rapidly uh, desensitizes the male brain because when a man masturbates to pornography, um, at, very quickly he habituates, his brain habituates to that stimulus and he needs more and more extreme uh, images or more and more novelty in order to reach that same level of desire. And so very quickly, um, and that's why you get the mainstreaming of images that used to be quite marginal, but also very quickly it means that he can't be as aroused with the, the partner in his bed. And so we're seeing this huge wave of healthy young men, healthy middle-aged men with um, a specific problem, they can't ejaculate, they, they can't come. Um, and we're seeing the same problem with young women who grow up masturbating to pornography, uh, although it's more anecdotal. So to me, you know, pornography is represented as this very liberating force 
to me, it's a giant, possibly a hundred million dollar industry, I don't have the exact numbers, vast industry um, that's actually uh, kind of exploiting a vulnerability in the male brain and soon the female brain without disclosure. So to me, it's like the early days of cigarettes. I'm not making a moral judgment about pornography. Just about to say it's like cigarettes. Yeah. An addictive habit exactly. that appears cool and but, you discover it gives you cancer. Exactly. But people, I think, deserve to know and make, make choices. So, are, so if more and more of those images are what I would call misogynist, because they have to be, because that's where the, you boost the you know, uh, new stimulus. Is that these guys being misogynists? No, they're in the thrall of a machine that is trying to, um, yeah, to, to, to make use of them for profit. But there is a human on the end of the machines somewhere down the road. Well, certainly, and you know, I don't think any discussion of pornography is adequate without a discussion of the production conditions in which very often women <clears throat> and men and children who are abused and exploited uh, or in a dangerous situation are producing the content. Yeah. Um, I, I want to just go back to your first book, The Beauty Myth, mm -hmm. because when you wrote that, the, the whole idea of, of, of the pressure on body image, the pressure on the idea of beauty, the pressure on the idea of perfection, I mean, it wasn't a new thing to talk about. It was a very important thing to talk about. But even though you talked about it very, very cogently, actually, I would say it's, it seems to be getting worse um, because we talk to 11, 12-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 9-year-olds now, and really the, they're saying that is the thing they feel most strongly, which is that they feel they have to be perfect first, physically mm. perfect first, then they'll follow up with all the rest of it. Wow. Uh, and, I mean, that's, for me, one of the most disturbing things, that as children are getting older quicker, mm. they are taking on board some of the, the, the worst aspects of, um, of that, you know, gender-biased thinking. And it, it seems that at a time when their brains are still developing so quickly, and we, we are understanding that they're having tremendous... Problems. I mean, that's what all the report back from head teachers to me is right. in this country. <clears throat> wow. And I, so I was wondering really whether the the wave of discussion that that was released in the early 90s about it, or, or even earlier than that, whether you think that that conversation, which Susie Orbach is is still d developing strongly, whether you think that the, 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 the that we have taken it on as a really serious issue, or whether it was a kind of a phase that people talked about, and now they're not talking about it so much anymore. Um. Well, I guess I see beauty myth issues getting better and worse. Um, so definitely numbers for anorexia and bulimia have not gotten better. Wow. Um, what Dove did this very interesting study that showed if, if I don't, if I do it like this, can you all hear me? <clears throat> I'm, I'm having my own <laughs> issue. <laughs> there we go. All right. Um, how's this? Is this good? Yeah, it's fine. So Dove showed that about 18% of women make their own definitions around beauty and are change agents. And about 20% of women are more trapped than ever. And it sounds like some of these girls are, maybe that's a, a phase in their development where they mm -hmm. are very much confined in those ideals. And what's scary is that um, retouching, which used to create perfection when I wrote The Beauty Myth, is now completely computer generated. Yeah. Uh, so they're comparing themselves with something that doesn't even exist in a human form anywhere. Um, and then the great mass of women in the middle are either change agents or feeling more trapped than ever, sort of depending on the day, right, and what they've been exposed to. Um, I do think there's a lot more discussion or it's more uh, known that there are um, influences of these images that are profit-driven and that they're not objective. Um, but there are also new technologies that mean that there's sort of no end of what you can do to yourself uh, if if you go that if you, you go that route. I'm not condemning. I'm just noting that there's sort of a higher and higher bar. I've also noticed that the women in Star, which I read, it's a tabloid in the United States every week for research purposes, um, <laughs> are just shrinking and shrinking and just absolutely skeletal. I mean, even more so than when I wrote the Beauty Myth. I guess I'd like to check in with those girls when they're 17 
and when they're 20. Because even though I know that teenage girls and preteens suffer a lot, and I would say you have unique forms of misogyny in the mass media in this country. My country has its own unique forms, but there is something about the constant, vicious, savage attack on mature women in this country, in the mass media, and achievers, um, and the, uh, side by side with a page three girl, that is gonna imprint any nine-year-old mm -hmm. who's just trying to figure out how to grow up. Um, I mean, I just saw my AOL homepage. AOL ha showed beautiful Joanna Lumley, and it said something like, um, some young actor had to have 27 takes to kiss her. And it was just a flat out, one of these flat, this is misogyny, you know, flat out, mature women are gross, you wouldn't want to kiss them if you're a young guy, ick. You know, can you imagine the parallel with a man? You know, nubile, 23-year-old Mila Kunis can't bring herself to kiss 52-year-old Tom Cruise because that's so disgusting. I mean... Yes, yeah, I think that, that, that or, or some of the way that you would no longer ever be able to be racist about mm. uh, the difference between something, and then mm. for women, I think the language is completely permissible at all right. levels. Right. I mean, you think it's particular to the UK? Uh, no, I think the UK has a particularly vicious strain in certain um, mainstream media outlets. Mm -hmm. uh, we have our own problems. Um, but what I was going to say is, on every college campus and everywhere I meet women in their 20s of all backgrounds and sexualities, I feel very hopeful because they are finding so many ways, whatever their confusion earlier in their lives, they're finding so many ways to make their zines or create their own um, blogs or critique what they see that they don't like or create movements on campus um, to empower other women uh, or to talk about eating disorders or to talk about how stupid you know, some of these pressures are. And really, even more exciting, to make other kinds of culture like, uh, like what you're doing. Um, so I don't feel that women of the upcoming generations, I think they're held down by it, but I think they're fighting back super hard and creatively. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'll, I'm just gonna ask you one more question, but before I do, I just wanna talk about handing over to the audience and you're gonna ask questions now. But can I say, because it's a very big hall, um, th this is how we're gonna do it. There's two microphones, one's there and one's there. And so if you have a question, could you head up there with your question and you can speak from the microphone either on one of those two things. However, if you are unable to leave your seat because you have a disability, we know where you're sitting, then we have a microphone to come to you if you want to do that. So those people who have a question, I know it's like, oh my God, and I've got to get up and I've got to walk across the whole of the aisle and so on. But you know, if we're gonna change the world, you have to have courage. <laughs> so, so don't be shy. Yeah. Uh, head up to a microphone, there or there, uh, or if you can't because you're disabled, then just wave and somebody will bring a microphone to you. Uh, and while you're doing that, and I'm, I'm looking, is anybody moving? Is anybody going to move? Go move. Yes, thank you. Um, the, 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 one of the things that happened in our conversation today on the ballroom between two men and two women was basically, I mean, it was Jon Snow, one of our very well-known broadcasters, saying that... Um, he really could never imagine, at this point anyway, men gathering in the way that we are all gathering and have been gathering for many years. He can't imagine men being able, in a way, to openly talk about all the range of issues to do with masculinity that are holding men oh, back. Oh, wow. And, and, <coughs> and, 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 that, and that actually, that, that he said he came in and felt envious. I thought it was a very, very good thing to say because, you know, it's like, well, once you're able to talk about it, you are beginning to know how to change it. That's for sure. And, and so the optimism that you've talked about is presumably that in the last hundred years, the speed at which feminist thinking has been moving and, and making change. I know it's not universal, it's not across the whole world, it's not consistent, but you know, you've talked about optimism and happiness. And, and do you feel that, that, that this speed of change is still going forward and, and, and will happen fast. Is it the 21st century reality that gender equality will come about, do you think? Oh, wow. Um, so, well, I, I just look at the women and men in this room. I mean, first, I'm very happy to say that it's a mixed gender audience, you know, and that's a huge triumph of feminism, you know, that we're sort of getting it. I, I think the younger generation already gets it and is creating new theories about how it's not 
it, it's about a more evolved relationship between people of all genders rather than a thing by women for women alone. Um, and I think that's really wonderful. Um, I do feel really hopeful because look at what's happening in the world. I mean, there are some conversations that are extremely stupid, that stay stupid. Like the mass media will never have a smart conversation about work-family balance mm -hmm. um, because it's in corporate interests, interests not to have, not to let corporate controlled media have a smart conversation about work-family balance because uh, they're profiting from women being grossly underpaid across the board in every sector. And they don't want that ever to change because it would cost them billions and billions of pounds. Um, that's never gonna change, but what I love is that women and men who care about women's equality are not w waiting to be dictated to by those special interests. And I'm especially excited in feminism at global conversations because what's really cutting edge, we screened a, a, a film today uh, called The Square, which is about the revolution in Egypt, in Tahrir Square, directed by a, a young woman, um, produced by young women in their 20s, featuring young women who were, toward, hey, there she is, oh my God, there she is. And, it, it, and, and people can support this film by going to thesquarefilm.com. The square so this, <laughs> Dina Amer, Dina Amer, thank you. Thank you, Dina. All right. This is so great because my, what I'm trying to invoke, the face of feminism in the you know, immediate future is standing up right here. <laughs> Thank you. So this, this is good. So she and her, her friends, you know, they, they, they went out reporting, right? They don't come from a culture in Egypt that has been doing cutting edge reporting for decades. They go out, they get the story, they get arrested. A teenage girl who's with their crew got held by the military police, beaten up. You know, th these young women were having, not these, I hope and trust, but you know about the virginity test that young activists were having inflicted on them, quote unquote virginity tests. And terrified, beaten, oppressed, they go right back out there and get the story. And they're leading this revolution, these young women. They are in the forefront in leadership positions. Now they're doing leadership differently. They're doing it inclusively. They're using social media. They're shining a light on others. They're teaching the whole world about a different model of leadership, which is one reason it's good to include women. They might, you know, complement our knowledge of leadership. I'm not saying they lead in any one particular way, but you know, there, there are women all over the world changing the conditions of their lives. And so I don't think Western feminism, frankly, is in the vanguard. Um, I think it's well not in the vanguard, but I think that we can learn every day about how to be in the vanguard in our own societies from the women in the developing world who are leading these revolutions. Okay, so is there somebody up on there with a, with a question up there? Yes, off you go. Could... I'm sorry, I'm not a public speaker, so pardon me. Um, but I'd be really interested in hearing your thoughts about two topics. One is um, Anna Gaskin, who um, yes. recently did a film um, released about her. And also, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts about the article that you wrote, uh, I think it was in the New Republic, about abortion. Can I take three questions? Can I take three questions? Sure. You know, yeah. one after the other? Yeah, sure. So would, oh, that's, that's great. Hold that. Yes, over here. Okay. Um, you talked about dopamine and assertiveness. When I was nine, I went to a Roman Catholic school. I didn't like it very much. Um, they're very <laughs> anti-sex. Now, they can't really claim the Bible because if you read the Sol Song of Solomon, it's the raunchiest book going. And I wonder... Um, I've always seen them as, as more a mechanism for control than anything else. I've always thought they had more to do with Constantine than Jesus Christ. So we'll want you to quickly ask your question. So, so basically, do you think that the Roman Catholic attitude to sex has to do with this opp oppression of people, you know... Dopamine suppression. Yes. Good question. Great. Thank you. And the third one up there, the lady with the blouse, yeah. <laughs> OK. 
Okay, okay. so shall yeah. I take them? Yeah. Oh, so I'm going to try to take these sort of uh, quickly and without forgetting. And um, I'm going to start with the last one first. So yes, it's very widespread that young women and girls don't want to use the F word. It's true in my country as well. It, it doesn't bother me that much as long as they're engaged in other kinds of advocacy for themselves as women. And often, as you say, you find that women who shy away from calling themselves feminists are, you ask them, do you want representation in government? Do you want education? Do you want to be paid equally for equal work? And they're, yes, 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 do you want to not be raped? You know, right down the line, feminist agenda. The, there are good reasons and bad reasons that the word feminism has such a mixed reception right now. As long as women advocate in their own behalf, I'm not bothered so much about labels. However, it is useful to reclaim a label, which is why I love what you're doing, I keep saying that, um, because it helps you have something around which to understand each other and to organize. So I would say keep being the role model that you are and keep raising these questions with them. And that's feminism in practice. You know, that's, that's quite revolutionary. Um, so that's that question. And... Catholics? Catholics. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, well, so, you know, what I teased out from the data is a hypothesis. And it's going to take, you know, a fair amount of documentation. And I'm excited to say that um, some of the scientists I'm in contact with are planning these, uh, these experiments to test, um, you know, with, for instance, women who've had clitoridectomies, do they have less dopamine after a sexual experience or in anticipation of a sexual experience? Um, so, as I can only answer your question hypothetically, but I think that it's very fascinating. You know, when I put these pieces together in the uh, dopamine section, of course I thought about the fact that organized religion, since St. Paul, has sought to repress human sexuality and to make human beings in the West feel that their sexual impulses were demonic and evil, and uh, that the vagina, you know, was the abyss of hell and a gateway to perdition. These are actual quotes from fourth century um, church fathers. Um, and, you know, you look at the scandals around boys being abused in the Catholic Church, and you see the same kind of shaming and um, silencing that are directed at at women around sexual shame. So I think it's likely that we're gonna find that organized religion targets sexuality partly because that makes people more compliant in general. I'm willing to say that's a hypothetical. I don't have documentation to confirm that. It's a hypothetical that is plausible to me. Um, now, what was the first question? Abortion and our bodies, our souls. And oh, and Ina May Gaskin, okay. So the speaker there, I, I wish I could still see you all. There you are. And you brought up Ina May Gaskin because she's a midwife. And what was your question about her? She is, okay, she's amazing. So Ina May, I wrote a book called Misconceptions about childbirth and Ina May Gaskin, I do worship. She's a midwife in Tennessee, a hippie like, the, like my people that I grew up with. And um, she opposes the Western interventionist model of childbirth. And actually, she was instrumental in my dopamine thesis. And I told her this at the screening of her movie recently, which is called A Birth Story, I believe, because she pointed out that you can't give birth well if you're under stress, and that stress stops the contractions and stress stops lactation. And I was fascinated that she got these amazing outcomes for childbirth by encouraging couples to make, to make out or to kiss. Um, and that uh, the things that medical science does, like episiotomy and hooking you up to a monitor, stop your contractions because they stress you out. And so that brain 
uterus connection and the brain nipple and uh, milk gland connection is well documented in the science and in that book. And no one had a problem with that idea that the brain and the uterus are connected. Um, but it's the exact same mechanism that I tease out with the brain vagina connection in mm -hmm. vagina. Um, and I want to say one more thing about Ina May and the, the debt that I owe to her. She talked about the importance of the autonomic nervous system. Um, she actually has a theory that she calls the sphincter theory, which is not such uh, harmonious phrasing because I've seen her use that on American television and immediately get cut off and switch to commercial. You know, the minute she says sphincter theory. Um, but but it's, it's important for our discussion because what she means is anything that is a threat to a mammal in a process involving a sphincter makes the sphincter not able to function. Okay, so this is her point about childbirth. Now, let's move on to more romantic language. Um, there's this long, I think, fascinating section in vagina, which is about the autonomic nervous system. And no one teaches us how sexy and poetic and beautiful and important our autonomic nervous system is. What is that? It's the involuntary part of your systems that when you're being aroused or being seduced or someone's giving you pleasure, it boosts your heart rate, which sends blood coursing to, uh, to your skin, which makes your skin more sensitive, helps your nipples become erect, um, makes your inner labia swell with blood, makes your outer labia swell with blood, helps your clitoris become erect, and helps you lubricate. Um, and all of these processes are critical to what neuroscientists call activation before orgasm, which is so important to women. Now, no one talks about activation in our model of female sexuality. It's all about orgasm, right? But you all know, when I say the sentence, the difference between an orgasm after having been highly activated and an orgasm without those activation processes being set orgasm. in play. Yeah, yeah. So, so, what is the one thing, and you can take a guess, 700 of you, that will stop that autonomic nervous system from engaging in all those beautiful, erotic, incredible things that heighten your pleasure so much? What's going to stop it? Stress. And other variants of stress are fear, shame, definitely, to your point back there, and resentment or anger, right? Stops it. So this is so important because it means that if your lover or husband or wife or girlfriend, if your issue is that he or she puts the dirty socks beside the hamper instead of putting them in the hamper, this is going somewhere, and, <laughs> and he or she does that at 7 o'clock in the morning and then comes home and wants to make love to you at 7 o'clock at night and you're still annoyed about it, you cannot just switch on. You can't do it, and you're not a bitch, and you're not withholding. It's actually your body being unable to transition into this heightened, beautiful, open, transcendental state of heightened activation and a relaxed autonomic nervous system. And to me, this is so revolutionary because it means if you want a woman enthusiastically to want to make love to you for the rest of her life, you have to be nice to her for the rest of her life. <laughs> That's just too demanding a concept. I know, right? <laughs> okay, uh, who's got the microphone? Uh, anybody here? Want to, uh, who, anybody? Anybody? Uh, questions up there? Yes, yes, off you go. And there's Lily here too. Oh, she wants me to answer the abortion question. I talked about babies, okay, but yeah. not abortion. Should uh, I answer it before we go on quickly? Uh, let's take no? two more questions okay. and then add the abortion into that too. Yes, thank, yeah, thank you. You, yes. Yeah. Yes, you. Um, I just wanted to ask what you think about the pressure on to be hairless, um, just kind of everywhere. Okay. And, and, and could you hold up your, that's a great question. Can you hold up your hand wherever She's you there. are? She's there with the microphone up there top. All right, thank you. Hairless. Okay, and one more question up here. Thank yeah. you from the lady there. Yeah. Um, I, recently, I recently read an article um, about how Beyonce was our most visible feminist role model, role model to young women. Uh -huh. And uh, she talks about empowering women and her curvy figure and own career and all this kind of thing, but next to it, she's pictured half naked in a man's shirt with 
underwear. I'm <laughs> wondering what this is. So funny. What was the publication? It's, it's, well, the, uh, it's GQ magazine that she was in, and The Guardian was criticized again. I see. Wow. Okay. Are there, am I answering yeah, this? Off. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Beyonce first. So was that a British GQ? Okay, it doesn't matter. It's the same all over the corporate media. I mean, you know, God bless Beyonce, she's great. Um, there, you know, I think of Malalai Joya, a 32-year-old Afghani parliamentarian who sleeps in a different place every night because she has been threatened with rape and death threats by her colleagues in the Afghani parliament and she's there to represent women's interests. You know, she's not posing in her underwear in GQ, but she is quite a feminist. Um, I mean, I guess what I would say is that it's depressing to me, but I don't take it that seriously. I try not to spend a lot of energy on it, that the mainstream media, especially in Britain, routinely will say, it's the 80s, Spice Girls, most visible feminists. It's the 90s, Ingenue in her underwear, most visible feminist. It's 2013, you know, pop star, most visible feminist, because they don't want to give space to the women who are actually changing the world um, because that, as I keep saying, threatens power relations. <laughs> Hairlessness. So women of my generation and older tend to keep their hair, <laughs> from what I understand. <laughs> yes. Um, but I also understand that uh, and I see this at the gym, that younger women are, there is definitely a depilation thing that is very uh, obvious. Um, <laughs> and I think the reason has to do with pornography, um, that the, uh, the, the image, you know, younger people grow up learning about sex from pornography. And uh, characteristically, the pornographic vagina and vulva are hairless, and this partly has to do, unfortunately, with, I talked about needing more and more edge or extreme experiences with the implication that that's a very young girl, right? Or it may even be a prepubescent girl or suggest a prepubescent vagina. The other thing that's a little scary to me is the rise of labiaplasty, which is related to this. Many of the pornographic vaginas you see are hairless and have had labiaplasties. And what's definitely happening is that women with completely normal labia, which I will tell you, and I didn't know how much until I researched this book, span a vast range of variability and voluptuousness or, or you know, differentness or asymmetry or whatever. Um, completely normal, healthy women with normal, healthy labia are going to doctors and saying, there's something terribly wrong with me. Uh, I need a labiaplasty, and, or the doctors are saying, yes, there's something wrong with you. I recommend a website called vulvavelvet.com if you have any questions about your labia, <laughs> because it shows this incredible variability. Um, so yeah, I, I think that it's the influence of pornography and the colonization of our, our most intimate moments by that pornographic model. Uh, okay, so, so next question. Oh, abortion, sorry. We haven't we touched abortion yet. Abortion. I should also say before I transition that some women just like it because it, you know, to them it feels better. So I don't want to disregard that. Yeah, actually, there was, we had a, a, a great debate last year. I'm a feminist. Can I have a jazzle? And um, <laughs> it was a great debate. I, I think that one of the things that is very complicated, like high heels, is, and lips, and all kinds of other things like this, is, um, you know, when women decide that they want to do it, it doesn't necessarily help for other women to then, you condemn. know, condemn right. and uh, and marginalize and get right. cross with, right. because if we were all able to live out our utter ethical perfection, then you know that would be a great thing. But it, it's very hard, I think, to 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 know what is your personal taste, what is the the, the, the thing that gives you a kick that you like, right. etc. And um, I think it, it and just, and just what, and, and what you shouldn't be doing because, you know, the, the, the ought. Right. It's, See, I hate all shoulds. Yeah, me I, too. I, I think we should stop saying should about what other you. women's yeah. sexual choices. Well, that's what I, I was going to say, that in a way, women being kind to each other yeah. also produce a lot of, you know, yeah. for me. Yeah, that's yeah. good. That's good. Um, I want that on my T-shirt, too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, abortion? Do you want to tell um, us that single-handedly? Sure. I, I just, I'm just thinking about piercing. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> At the same but, time? <laughs> uh, no, no. Oh, God, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. No, just to the question about sort of uh, vaginal fashion. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yes. But look, I, growing up in San Francisco, I actually think it's wonderful when people, you know, have all kinds of things they do because they're curious or they're interested or it's something that pleases them. But yeah, I'm interested in people finding those things out for themselves and feeling comfortable with their own identities rather than feeling like, I mean, to, to your point about, or our point about the pornographic vagina, on college campuses across America, the number one health issue for young women is anal fissures. Why is that? Because they are having anal sex on drunken hookup nights with young men who are also drunk and hooking up. And I have, I'm not judging anal sex. It is, you know, one of the things. And if you read Vagina, you'll see why some women like anal sex so much. The variability in our neural wiring means some of us have more uh, neural termini in our clitorises, some in our vaginas, some in our cervixes, some in our perineum, some in our anuses. It's, there's all kinds of stuff that makes people happy. However, these young women were doing it in a, with strangers in a drunken condition, which is not necessarily, it's like, driving at night, you know, you want to know where you're going. Um, and, and they were uh, getting injured and they were doing it, they said, because porn means that they feel like they need to offer that as a, a thing. Uh, now abortion, oh, it's such a sharp transition. Um, yes. Do you want to come back to that? Yeah, let's second? come back okay. to it. Yeah, can I take another couple of questions up there? Thank you. Um, you talked about um, doctors having to sort of ask people if they do masturbate because that is a perfectly normal thing and everybody should do it, right? Uh, I didn't say that. I said they should incur it, make sure that they are doing it or make sure that they are told how beneficial it is. They yes. shouldn't have to do it. And they shouldn't... I'm, I'm not saying they need to uh, interrogate their patients about their masturbatory practices. But. Okay, sorry. Um, that, <laughs> That's okay. I, at the same time, I do not think that if it is a good and normal thing to do, do you not think that we should sort of start talking about it more openly because I've been to a talk today and the, the women on the panel, they were brilliant and they said that the one thing that women do never talk about is how they get that pleasure right. on their own. Right. So I do not think that is something that we should work on as a community of women. I, I totally do and I applaud you and this is a very gutsy thing to have said. <laughs> Hand, a big round of applause to this brave young woman. Can I speak to the masturbation question? Yes. Thank you. Um, and what I love is you should not feel alone because every talk, um, this comes up as it should. So the answer is totally yes. And, you know, again, history just, what makes me sad about feminism is we haven't created, which is why things like this are so important, institutions to hold institutional memory. Because Betty Dodson in the 70s was convening groups of women and teaching them to masturbate and giving them information and videos, uh, she's still doing it, about how to masturbate. And this was life-changing for many women who couldn't reach orgasm. Of course, you need to know how to masturbate, ideally, uh, in order to more easily reach orgasm with a partner or with yourself. And the things I said about pleasure, I really want to stress, if you're in a relationship or not in a relationship with a man or a woman or you know, polyamorous or whatever, the, the pleasure, the benefits of this pleasure are just as important when you're alone, and I would say even more important. And that the benefit to your well-being in other areas of doing the things that give you pleasure, of treating yourself like a lover, are so critical, you know, whether it's running a bath, if that gives you pleasure, that smells good, or, you know, soft fabrics, or, you know, really taking care of yourself sexually in a very attentive way. Um, this boosts all those chemicals and neurotransmitters we've talked about. And the other really important thing I want to tell you, and Jim Faust, the neuroscientist at Concordia University, who's, um, you know, at the cutting edge of this information, stresses this and shows it with his experiments. Female sexuality has a use it or lose it quality. So that if you don't keep your sexual response alive with yourself, it, it can 
kind of die out. And you know, if you're if you're older, many older women um, experience this too. And the loss of libido, you know, can often happen because after only five or six negative sexual experiences, Jim Faust's female rats, you know, don't want to do it anymore. They lose desire. So stoking one's own desire is very very important. Now, how to masturbate? Very critical question. There's another section of this website, vulvavelvet.com, where women write in and talk about how they masturbate. And again, I really encourage you to look at this. Um, I know there's some books out, I think there's some books out with examples, but you know, kitchen appliances, my goodness. <laughs> the uses to it's which- far better than Jimi Hendrix. The, yeah. What did you say? I it was far better than Jimi Hendrix. Far better than Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> um, the, 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 so many women are like, well, the sitting on top of the dryer when it's running, or the, you know, I won't even get into the electric toothbrushes. Um, but but uh, women are very inventive and very creative. Um, running water is a continual theme, you know, shower heads, right? And if I'm giving you ideas, you know, by all means, I mean, this is what the Women of the World Festival is for, the exchange of ideas. Uh, um, and there's some, Amazing new technologies, if you go to a website, some of my favorite websites, one called Babeland, which sell, it's like a female positive sex toy website with a helpline where they've got these lovely young women from all different sexualities who are just, and women of all ages, who are just there to like support you in learning about your new toy. But there's real advances in um, vibrators and sex toys that uh, stimulate G-spot or vaginal orgasms. You know, I'm not saying those are better than any other kind, um, but it's just a new frontier in the uh, sex toy world. Um, so I hope I've validated that young woman asking about masturbation. I do want to give you one caveat, which is that apparently vibrators, electronic vibrators, can also desensitize over time. And so you just want to know that you want to vary your stimulation in order to protect your sexual response. Um, is that helpful? Uh, it was to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, let's keep going. Um, right, there's uh, over here and over there. Yes, over there. thank you. Yes? Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask, um, seems science has actually managed to establish that there are no substantial differences in social, psychological and emotional functioning between males and females. In other words, you can't tell whether it's a male or a female from their performance on a particular aspect. Mm. Why are politicians still giving um, uh, so much allowance to religion's dogmas that allow horrific forms of discrimination and prejudice towards women? Um, and I also want to ask, what can we do about statutory organizations in this country which trap women into dangerous situations such as hostels, refuse to move us when we say that we are feeling sexually threatened, and then victimize us when we report that we have been sexually assaulted, and particularly victimize us, as do various other people, some of whom may be in this hall, when the person who's abused us happens to be a failed asylum seeker or an asylum seeker, and has been attempting to use us as a means of okay. gaining leave to remain in the UK. Um, okay. okay, thank so, you very much for that question. So thank you, I'm gonna to speak to what you said, but I, I really wanna separate your, uh, your concerns. I'm, I'm sure they're very um, passionately felt. The second one sounds very specific, and I'm not gonna address it in a general context. It sounds like you need guidance, and I'm happy to talk with you afterwards to direct you to the right... I don't think it's specific. I think it's happening frequently. Okay. So these are two big questions, and I don't know anything about the second one, but I can find people who do know about it. But I want to address the first one, which... And then we can connect afterwards to direct you to the right people for the second one. All right. So why do they... So I'm going to give you a really important secret right now, everybody. There's, this is one thing we've learned about feminism, or, or you know, at least this is a conclusion I've come to in 26 years of traveling around the world and listening to how women are struggling and who's stopping them. When politicians, journalists, editors 
make you explain it over and over and over again about and show you evidence about why women deserve equality, you are in a uh, deliberate um, mouse wheel that is going nowhere, that has been set up for you to explain this forever. They know perfectly well that there is nothing wrong with us. They know perfectly well that women are just as good as any man at doing these jobs that they're creating context for you to explain and explain and explain it for. It is never about persuading the gatekeepers. They will never be persuaded because they already know the truth. The reason they set up those structures is to distract you and to distract us so that we'll be explaining it and arguing for the next 150 years rather than doing the only things that actually redistribute power, which is organizing. Uh, protesting, uh, engaging in shareholder activism, leaking embarrassing information to the media, challenging people uh, as uh, constituents, as uh, politicians, as grassroots um, organizations with uh, power at the ballot box. Um, and using, as I said, in Fire With Fire, money, the ballot box, and the mass media to force um, the goods to be redistributed. And this is especially true in Britain. Look, it's not, don't psychologize it. It's not psychological. When every single one of your amazing British women politicians is mocked in every goddamn British newspaper, north to south, you know, a highbrow to, to tabloid as being fat or stupid or too sexy or silly or muddled, you know, decade after decade after decade. It's not because they think it. It's because it's a way, it's because, you know, 3% of the British population, 90% of them aristocrats or children of aristocrats or went to Oxford or Cambridge, uh, own 50% of the goods and the great jobs, and they don't want the, a real meritocracy, right? So they don't want you reading or your daughter reading to think, well, that's an admirable, important woman getting a job done. I can do that. And they don't want to double the competition for those perks and for those privileges. Okay, I'm going to take another question. Okay. Yes, lady up there, thank you. And, and is that a change over time that you've noticed? Is it more fearful now? Yeah, I've only been qualified for two years, so I don't know if I, if I have the full experience of the full range, mm -hmm. but um, it's a surprising amount of majority. Right. God. I mean, yeah, you know, what's happened in the last 25 years is that our sexual privacy has been taken away. Um, so I think by, just by pornography, by this continual kind of surveillance of our genitals. And so I think that women may have more kinds of shame now than they would have 30 years ago when they really didn't see that many other women's vaginas unless they were involved with them romantically. Um, the other thing that's happened is that your NHS is being colonized by money interests just like our health system has been colonized. And it is in their interest to keep women ignorant about the birth process because the more interventions I'm not sure if your system is this bad yet, but in America, the more interventions there are, the more money the doctor makes. If you do a C-section, you make more money than if you do a natural labor. And if a woman labors with Pitocin, which speeds up contractions very painfully for two hours, uh, and you can fill up that uh, room with more and more laboring women in a you know, two-day period, you make more money than you do um, if you let her labor naturally for 24 or 48 hours or longer. Um, and also the way sex education is taught, uh, I think 
is very, is very fear-based. I think, weirdly, AIDS and STDs have meant that when you know, young girls and young boys hear about, but especially girls, hear about the vagina, they hear about all the terrible things that can happen to it and all the dangers that it's exposed to. And there's never, like in Sweden, there's discourse about pleasure in sex ed materials, but in Britain, in North America, in Western Europe, there's almost never a discussion about the clitoris in eighth grade biology class, right? Or sex ed class, or whatever you call it here. Um, and there's, so you hear about, you know, warts and STDs and pregnancy and, you know, horrible catastrophes, but there's no discourse of pleasure. So then this woman opens her legs in a hospital to another human being, and what she's opening is a narrative constructed of fear and shame and ignorance about the birthing process. Who, can you just raise your hands? Who was taught about the clitoris when they were taught about human biology and reproduction? One person way in the back, two people, three people way in the back. All right, wow. You used to teach about it yourself. And were you fired? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Okay, not the school. Right. Right. So this is an excellent sex educator who talks about the clitoris, but she wasn't doing it in the schools. So yeah, this is, you know, doing it in schools but not paid by the schools. Well done. Good job. Two more questions. Two more questions. Right. Well, I'm afraid there are people queuing at the microphone, but we've only got time for two more questions. I'm sorry for those people. I'm sorry, I should be briefer, shouldn't I? That the, 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 uh, you can come back. Okay, I'd love to. Uh, so the, the lady there, we, uh, and then we'll take uh, the lady there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I feel very privileged. Um, as I, I came here with one question. As I've been sitting here listening to you. I've been thinking, oh, I wonder, I wonder what she thinks of orgasmic meditation and the on movement. But that's something... Completely and the what? <laughs> Just uh, go to your first one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I, uh, possibly more, even more of a to-do than self-pleasuring. Uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, the menstruation and and how you. I haven't read any of your material about it. If you've talked about it, but how we get women to reconnect with their body and their body cycles and to respect and honour the cycle and the creative power in the cycle and make friends with it and harness that power and to stop feeling so disconnected from that part of themselves that's been chained by our patriarchal society. I just want to know your thoughts. Wow, that's a big one. Should I answer that? Or? I think we'll just get to one of the questions. Thank you. And that one? Thank you. Yep. Um, we are wondering if we could try and squeeze in because these two as one. They're not quite connected, but I know that um, this woman feels very, very strongly about... Okay, collaborative question. Yes, okay. So um, my question is, whilst I understand that your um, book um, is very much based around this new um, scientific discoveries of the vagina brain connection, I wanted to ask you um, about where um, transgendered experiences um, fit into your um, dogma, because... I feel like if a feminism is a, a movement that wants to move forward for women, and we're living in a society where female experience is diverse, and we accept that it is diverse, it felt to me like there was a certain element of marginalization, a little bit coming from cisgender privilege, and I wanted to ask you how you felt um, those vaginas, um, non-natal vaginas, vaginas and transgendered men fitted into your vision what? of a new biography of the vagina. Sure, and how do you define cisgendered? privilege? Um, the fact that um, if we are born cisgendered within... How do you define that for those who are not familiar with the term? Oh, okay, so yeah, um, mm -hmm. cisgendered, um, it's when your gender identity and your sex match. Mm -hmm. That's, so no, you know, 90% of people, 95% of people are cisgendered. Mm -hmm. And for those who don't necessarily match, there are issues of um, conflict between your genitals and your mind. Not always, but sometimes. And um, sex reassignment surgery can, for some people, be the right option to create a vagina from male genitals. Right. And I felt that perhaps your book was quite centered around the cisgendered experience. Of the I, vagina. I got it. All right. Thank you. So I'll take this one first and then... Or okay, but this, the her friend wants to sneak in. Okay. <laughs> Mine was sort of connected because it's about boys. Um, I read a report last week about um, a United Nations project that had failed in, in working in South Africa with um, 
AIDS. And the boys were practicing on their friends' sisters, so they knew how to um, be with their girlfriends and so on. All these little girls were being raped. Yeah. And they ran a program, and it completely failed. I wonder if you knew anything about that or what we can do for boys. Mm -hmm. I'm very concerned that you know we've got sons and we're raising boys, and how do we, how do we help them through this? How do we help them see something different? Wow, these are all such powerful questions. Um, let me start with the question about transgender first. Could I trouble someone for another glass of water? Or thank you so much. Um, so to, to answer your question, I actually don't believe in, so if, if that was what you took away from it, um, I need to communicate better what my intention is. Uh, it's certainly true that a, I'm talking about biology. And so it's certainly, you know, I got many interesting queries from, there's a group of women in Britain who were born with, they're women in their gender identity, but they were born without vaginas altogether. And they were asking me reasonably enough, well, where do we fit into this? So I'm not creating a, um, an ideology. I'm just reporting on science and teasing out some ideas based on that. Um, I think that there is incredible variability in human beings. I see it as even more variable than what you've described. I actually see human beings as all on a spectrum and all in you know, manifestations of individuation. I don't particularly feel, for instance, that my gender identity and my biology is in sync. I sometimes wonder, I've always been curious about that XY, XXY thing and wanted to take the test because sometimes I wonder if I have a little more you know, Just testosterone, yeah. <laughs> seriously. Um, but people are so variable. 4% of babies they're finding now are born with genitals that are not clearly male or female. So these, these constructs are quite artificial um, in some ways. Um, and I would go further. The new data that I'm finding, um, a flaw in the book, which has to do with a flaw in the science of the world, uh, of the database of the science, is that most of the studies about female desire and response are based on heterosexual couples. And uh, it was very difficult to find science based on lesbian couples, let alone transgender women or transgender couples, let alone um, you know, bisexual uh, women. Um, but the few studies there were confirmed to me that I no longer believe there is such a thing as a heterosexual woman. Um, it turns out that all women's brains who are born biologically female uh, respond, whatever they call themselves, gay, straight, bisexual, it doesn't matter, they respond to a whole range of sexual stimuli. And they'll be responding to male homosexual pornography, straight pornography, uh, you know, lesbian pornography, even while they tell researchers, well, no, that doesn't do anything for me. It's ex extraordinary. So I, I, don't, I don't even call, I don't think heterosexual is a category for women anymore. I mean, bonobo ape sex turns all women on, apparently, you know, whether they say that it's doing anything for them or not. So to your point, I think a ton more research is needed. I didn't see the studies of, the, of, of how uh, male to female, which is I think what you're asking about, transgender... Yeah, or the other way around, like vaginas um, in male identifying people right. as well. Right. So I've seen the book. There's an amazing book called 101 Vulvas, which shows biological female vulvas and also reconstructed, some reconstructed or newly constructed male to female vulvas. I haven't found the research in which male to female transgendered people are talking about what may be their brain-vagina connection. I would like to find that data, I'd like to incorporate it in future editions. If you know someone who can direct me to it, I'd be very grateful. But in the database, um, I didn't find that research. And that's a flaw in the science. Yeah. Okay. Uh, boys and periods, which would you like to do first? Boys. How do we raise boys? Oh, my God. I mean, as someone who's raising one of each, this is one of those answers that I know someday the Mommy Dearest book will come out and it'll be like... You know, so I, I, I hesitate to suggest that I have any hard and fast answers. But I think young men and boys are imprinted by m men showing respect for women, um, whether it's friends, whether it's coworkers, whether it's a single family, a single parent household or not. Um, 
I think it's very, very important for the men in this room to know how important they are to boys in role modeling respect for women. I also find it helpful, if annoying to my children, to constantly talk about my own reaction. I mean, this is just, I had an assistant once who called me empowerment nag. Um, and, you know, I can see that being my child would be hell on earth. But um, nonetheless, I, I, you know, they're beautiful children. And, and I, I would just recommend this for other people raising children because children I admire, uh, their parents often do this male or female parents or, you know, whoever the parents are, if you're transparent about your own responses, like you see a particularly vicious misogynist scene on television, um, and like, I don't know if you saw Hangover 2, but it was chock a block with nasty debasing scenes about transgendered people in particular. Um, and I just sort of kept expressing how I felt. It doesn't save your child from those influences out there, but I do think we inoculate our children in a way against some of these influences by giving them other perspectives to be critical um, about them from. Um, yeah, but in a funny way, it really is, you know, men, I think it's, I think it's biological, I think it's evolutionary. We learn, we look at women to learn to be women. We look at men to learn to be men. Um, and I'm just going back to admiring and shouting out all the men I know who are, you know, biological parents or not, you know, gay friends of the family, uh, people at work, um, people who just, you know, the, the men who come over to my house and just get up and do the dishes, you know, along with the women, they are role modeling something really important to the children in the house. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Do you want to end with the periods? No, I don't want to end with periods, but I'll address periods. Maybe we can end with something. Uh, I, I want to end with the masturbatory or orgasmic meditation. That's what I want to end on. <laughs> <laughs> so can I address periods and then you throw me that masturbatory meditation question or statement? Okay, yeah. Is that all right? Do yeah, we have enough time for that? All right. So how do we get women to embrace their periods? Oy, I, <laughs> You know, I can't say I embrace my period. <laughs> you know, it's fine. <laughs> you know, but um, I, but I understand your larger question. You know, how do we get? I think what you're saying, and a period is a metaphor. How do we encourage all of us to embrace our our reality in the world, right? And and not think our sexual and reproductive functions are gross and yucky. Is that is that where you're going? It's definitely part of it, but um, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Alexander Pope and the Wild Gene. And she talks about our, our cycle in a very literal way being the source of our power. And if we get in sync with our cycle at every moment of the month, we can organize our life to take advantage of the different energies at the different times of the month. Wow. Uh, I mean, that's fascinating, and it's bringing up in me responses that people like Zoe Heller and Suzanne more had to me. <laughs> like, what the hell is she talking about? But, uh, um, uh, but I, I hear you, and I'm not going to mock, A, because I haven't read it, but also B, there are these extraordinary body workers that are emerging. One of them is Tammy Lynn Kent uh, in Seattle, who believes, and she's having amazing outcomes, which is why I'm not going to mock, that women hold emotional trauma in their vagina and different quadrants of the vagina, and that by working on releasing that tension or those traumas in the vagina, she's having amazing healing outcomes with other issues, other illnesses, phobias, I mean, extraordinary stuff. Um, and it's also true that you do, and actually there are probably good reasons, when you're ovulating, you have luteinizing hormone. Luteinizing hormone makes you want to have sex with anything. <laughs> um, and you know, I'm sure that scientists will find other explanations for being energized at certain times of the month and less so at other times. I, what I like to say about PMS, you know, whenever I get really weepy and bitchy and cranky and awful, my, and I'll call and complain, actually, I call my mom, believe it or not, at 50, I call my mom. And she'll, she'll say, you know, after she's let me vent, are you near your period? <laughs> and um, I'll always say yes, 
because I vent like that at that time. But what I like to say, the reason I'm bringing this up is more oversharing, I'm blushing, um, <laughs> that what I like to say is that PMS doesn't make you think things are bad that aren't there. I'm actually quoting someone else who said this, but I don't know who. It surfaces to the light things that are bad that were there that need to be addressed. Um, so, to your point. Well, One for PMS. Yeah. Now, now can we go to meditative masturbation? <laughs> Absolutely. Or can. meditative orgasm? Is that okay, or are we it's, over time? No, we're not. We're, we've got th two minutes to cover that. Okay. So are you talking about that tantric practice that I've been told about in which you can get into a meditative state and just have an ongoing orgasm? It's a practice called orgasmic meditation, but that involves a, it's a 15 minute stroking of the clitoris. Um, the non-partners can do together. It's a meditative practice to have women connect with their body and their pleasures. And it's total focus on the clitoris. So non-partners, you mean some stranger is stroking your clitoris for 15 minutes? It's like a community, it's a practice. It's like you go to a yoga class and there are other people there who are... It's a practice. So, okay, so let me just visualize. So it's like a sangha of devotees, right? A group, a community. I'm not laughing either. I, just, I was just thinking, I was just saying this. <laughs> Have you any idea how much money was spent on the acoustic of this hall? If Larry Kierkegaard, who spent weeks and weeks and weeks, and we spent millions of pounds to get the acoustic of this hall right, so that, so that we could talk about... But this is like this, the best part fantastic. of the evening. This is fabulous. I no, I was just thinking how absolutely some people would be rolling in their graves and how, <laughs> and how wonderful it is. And how wonderful it is. That's right. That's right. So there's something real, I'm going to speak to this. When you leave here, you need to write to the who funds you. Uh, yeah, we, well, the Arts Council. Okay, yeah. you need to write to the Arts Council, all 700 of you, and you need to say specifically how important and valuable and community building and uplifting tonight's program was and the whole Women in the World Festival and how important and uh, a, a significant a leader Jude is because she's being very brave in um, taking the risk of giving us this space to have this conversation. And it's, it's very important that you support her. I mean, talk about feminism. It's very important you support her by them getting 700 letters saying, keep that money flowing to the South Bank Center and the Women of the World Festival under Jude's leadership because this is a valuable contribution to British society. Thank you. 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 Now, now back to meditative masturbation. Um, <laughs> So now you, one is touching one's own clitoris for 15 minutes with total concentration, or one's part, one's person on one's left is touching one's clitoris. <laughs> the, the, the male, I don't understand it because I haven't done it yet. I know there's a call coming up in May. Right. <laughs> You practice. You look very happy. <laughs> no, don't demonstrate here because she'll lose her funding. <laughs> Unless we play Beethoven at the same time, we can't. Right, exactly. <laughs> but, but if you answer questions outside, what, do you want to stand up and identify yourselves? <laughs> or no, you don't have no. to. That's all right. No, no, never mind. She, it's a, well, this brave woman and her partner... And, and afterwards, we'll go outside and all sign books, right? And they'll tell us about meditative masturbation, right? Yes. All right. So back to you. I've heard of this. What I've heard of is a variant, I think, which is the upper left quadrant of the clitoris. Right. This is the same thing. <laughs> um, and I've actually reported this uh, to the significant people. Um, <laughs> If you touch it just a tiny, tiny bit for a long period of time, amazing things happen, right? Is this the idea? It's not orgasm for the sake of orgasm, it's consciousness. 
sensation focused. And so then you get into a meditative state, all right, which doubtless boosts opioids because meditation also boosts yep. op opioids. So all I can say is I've heard of it. Try it. It's the enlightenment. You know, you, it's, you find out for yourself. You don't take anyone's word for it. You can report back um, on a blog somewhere. You can send your information to me at infonaomiwolf.org and I will report on it. Um, and, you know, it makes, it makes sense. I mean, one thing we haven't talked about is Tantra. At the, and it's interesting. This got a lot of criticism because it's counter to the dominant culture. The dominant culture is very anti-Tantra. It's, you know, if you look at porn, it's, well, Mike Luzada, who's a yoni guru here in London, whom I highly recommend, who is a, an interview subject in the book, he has amazing outcomes with women who've been sexually traumatized or who can't reach orgasm, who have other sexual issues. And he notes that the average man reaches orgasm in four minutes and the average woman uh, needs 16 minutes at least. And so, as he puts it, and I'm talking about heterosexual couples now, but this relates to anyone in a relationship with a woman, um, anyone who loves a woman needs to use what he calls patience and compassion. And the thing about these tantric workshops I went to to report on them <laughs> is that they would do this practice, and I promise to wrap it up, where there's something called sacred spot massage, which is not the same thing, but important, where the lover of the woman puts his or her hands like that and does a come here kind of gesture. It, but you ask... The assignment these tantric retreats is you do this to a woman for an hour and a half, right? And I'm thinking, do these people not have jobs? Do they not have children? You know? But the, the, uh, the group that I, I, I surveilled in New York, the men were instructed to take the women, and these people were strangers, up to their hotel room, run her a bath, make everything beautiful for her. Tantra is all about creating a beautiful environment for that mind-body connection. The science of this is in the section called the Goddess Array, which is what I get the most emails about thanking me. And um, then the men are instructed that it's all about her. Nothing is about you. For an hour and a half, you give her sacred spot massage. And, what's so, and I saw these women the next day and they are like transformed and radiant. And I'm like, what happened? And what comes up again and again is that so many of us, the numbers are terrible, 30% of women have been sexually harmed in some way by the time they're 18 by a trusted person. So many women have an inner monologue in lovemaking of, do I smell bad? Is he bored? Do I have to do something different? Do I not measure up? And we talked about stress that is anti-erotic, that suppresses activation of all those delicious systems, right? And so if you learn to receive as a woman, which is what this practice is all about, receive pleasure, it is transformational to these women. And then I ask these men who are doing Tantra, basically, what's in it for you? Because it's so unlike that porn model of like so goal-oriented and phallocentric, if you like. And bless their hearts. I mean, this is why I'm so hopeful about men after writing this book and hearing from them. They would say things like, who doesn't, very male things in a way, who doesn't want a very happy woman at the breakfast table, you know? <laughs> or, or they would say, who doesn't want to feel like a hero, right? <laughs> or, or they would say, which makes sense to me because of the male brain, they would say men are often process-oriented and they want to know that what they're doing is working and what they're doing is right. And you know, with this practice, you know <laughs> that what you're doing is right. Um, so I, I found that very beautiful. And I, I also find that, you know, we're in such a fast culture that when people unplug from the electronic overstimulation and turn to one another and use some of these practices that I explain the science of behind the Tantra and the meditative er erotic things, although I don't call it that, um, in that last section of the book, um, there's some very beautiful things that happen because the brain can recover uh, from being colonized by pornography. And also people do find in each other that, that love, that attachment, and in themselves, that liberationist quality that sex is supposed to be for all of us.